to day two of our spring textile design speaker series. I'm Marsha Weiss. I'm the director of the textile design programs. And we're very happy to have our current students, some of our alums, um, some prospective students, and um, other interested parties joining us today. So welcome to day two. We are very happy today to introduce our speaker, Royce Epstein, the A&D Design Director for Mohawk Group. And Royce's topic today is Future Wave, Five Ideas Driving Design. Royce, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you so much. I am gonna um, just give you a little brief intro about myself and then I'm gonna turn my camera off so you can focus on the beautiful slides that I have for you. Um, but I am the A&D Design Director for Mohawk and A&D stands for Architecture and Design. Um, and Mohawk is a, a large uh, flooring and carpet manufacturer. So uh, carpet's obviously a textile. We have a lot of people at our company and in our carpet industry that have graduated from Jefferson, which is really nice um, to see. And a and stands for architecture and design so that our clients are interior designers and architects who are specifying um, you know, flooring and carpet materials for their projects. Um, before I worked at Mohawk, I actually did work for a textile designer. Um, and we helped start a new textile company called Loom, which is spelled L-U-U-M, um, which is for Technion Textiles, Technion being a furniture manufacturer. So I had a lot of fun in those days um, doing product design and development and marketing for this new textile company, um, which is now off and running, which is great. Um, in my role at Mohawk, um, I do a lot of trend research. So this is where this talk really comes out of. I do a lot of observations of cultural trends and what's happening in the world and how that affects the language of design. And so this is just a short talk looking at um, five, different, um, five different ideas that are driving design. So we're gonna take a glimpse into the future of our design industry through these cultural shifts that affect how we live. Um, of course, we're gonna look at COVID. We're gonna look at the digital revolution, which has been a longer trend of the last 25 years or so. And of course, we're also going to look at climate change, another important one. So I want to start with this quote. In the waves of change, we find our direction. We're living in a time of great uncertainty today with the nature of work, home, and public life incredibly disrupted by this pandemic. And as a collective industry, designers that are practicing architecture and interiors and industrial design and textile design and fashion and related disciplines, we're all doing what we do best which is to use our design thinking and creativity to focus on human-centered design solutions to help sustain us. And I can't stress that more. Um, I've been using this word sustain as sort of a, a key word for how designers are going to design the future. We need to figure out how to you know, thrive and sustain. Um, so we must be able to think about all aspects of design through this lens of humanity and empathy and sustainability if we are gonna move forward during this era of change. And I also think we need to expand our definition of sustainability where we can visualize a world of optimism through resilience, adaptation, and restoration. So the first trend we're going to look at now is called bio-based. With our world now damaged and depleted from pollution and climate change and an overabundance of unhealthy materials, there's a new practice of design emerging where designers are looking for natural alternatives to synthetic materials, as well as exploring new biomimetic techniques for production. This movement is called disruptive materiality, where designers are cross-pollinating with the biosciences to reinvent materials as we currently know them. Since the mid-century, plastics and synthetic materials have been the mainstay of our consumer lifestyles, but things are changing as we seek bio-based materials and products to help mitigate the damage to the earth. Plastic materials do not biodegrade. They take about a thousand years just to break down into smaller components. And all the time they're leaching chemicals of concern into water and landfill. Therefore, many designers and consumers are looking for bio-based alternatives, envisioning a world where biological fabrication, or we also call that biofacturing, replaces synthetic manufacturing. So this covers not just materials for the built environment, but also food and cosmetics and consumer goods like fashion. Some of the most prevalent natural ingredients include algae, mycelium, which is actually mushroom, um, organic dyes from fruits and vegetables, bacteria and microbes, 
and something called chitosan, which comes from the exoskeletons of lobsters and shrimp. Designers are working together with these scientists and even farmers to harvest these bio-based materials and then manipulate them into a stable and usable material for design and product development. In the case of mycelium and bacteria, these can be grown into shape or form and can create anything from shoes to jackets to furniture, lighting, and even architectural structures. Shown at the left is a chair designed by Eric Clarenbeek, who's known for working with biomaterials and newer design technologies. This mycelium chair, again mushroom, was 3D printed using a combination of the thread-like fungi structure of yellow oyster mushrooms, powdered straw, since oyster mushrooms like to grow on straw, and water. The mycelium then grew within the structural components of the chair after printing, replacing the water. Once the mushrooms were grown, Clarenbeek dried out the straw surface, which was fused as composite material with the mycelium, resulting in a durable yet wet, lightweight chair frame. He added a layer of 3D printed bioplastic to cover the frame, which prevented the mushroom components from growing any further. So in this image, the mushrooms are actually just shown for decoration. Um, Clara Beek believes that this 3D printing technique, which incorporates living organisms and biomatter, is a sign of things to come. At the right is the work of Malu Lucking. She's a design student in Berlin who creates textiles from algae. Algae is a water-saving resource for the textile industry, and it also grows in abundance in warmer climate conditions. So it's actually really good during this time of global warming because global warming aids in its availability. Malu's project harvests the fibrous algae from lakes in Germany, and she uses their different qualities to produce various textiles. So one is a wool-like texture, another has a translucent um, sort of non-woven structure to the fabric, and yet another is turned um, just into a yarn that can be processed as a biodegradable bioplastic. Also shown here is the textile dye experiments by Dutch designers Raw Color using vegetables in varying ratios for color saturation. And then there's the work of Neri Oxman. She's one of the leaders of biodesign. She teaches at the MIT Media Lab with her Mediated Matter Research Group. Oxman pioneered the field of material ecology, which is the intersection of material science with the synthetic biology, along with computational design and digital fabrication. So they're using like math and algorithms to actually generate design. Um, and she's applying that knowledge to design across many different disciplines, media, and scale. So they're creating small experimental materials, but they're also creating large design installations. Um, and Neri Oxen is quite famous, so luckily there's a lot of great, um, you know, documentaries and information about her. So if you look her up, uh, you can learn a lot more about her. So this next area we're going to look at um, is called fidgetal, and this is really related to digital fabrication. It's a new area of a design practice today. Um, and this is, the term fidgetal really comes from this idea of physical meeting digital. So fidgetal, it's a mouthful, sorry. Fidgetal is bringing physicality to the digital world and then also giving physical presence to digital things through complex renderings and videos. Virtual tactility has emerged as an important feature in renderings where reality is being reflected through newer versions of our 3D world that seem tangible. There's also a whole practice of design now involving a new type of space where the convergence of the real and virtual objects can coexist together in pixels. So the rise of the virtual presence offers this question. Can something be a design object if it only lives in the virtual world? One thing we do now is that the online world is getting more real looking with hyper textures and new forms and otherworldly color that look very um, you know, palpable, like you can reach out and touch it. And this is illustrated in interiors and exterior environments and furniture, um, textiles, household objects. So we're seeing this emerge as a tool now for all industries to present new realities. Retail has really embraced this, presenting these new visuals as advertisements, for example, where they can render a space and then insert a product placement or even an avatar, like a, a human that's, or it looks like human, but someone who's like an avatar um, that resembles uh, real life, whether it's an object or a person to promote these products and create, um, you know, obviously Instagrammable moments and create um, covetable images, I would say, for social media. 
On the left, we see the work of Alexis Christodoulou. He's an artist from South Africa who works in this arena of 3D renders. He creates imagined architectural spaces that are stunning. Uh, I think they're very dreamy and surreal. They offer a bit of escapism from our reality. The studio of six and five at the center uh, bottom and that top left, they create still life illustrations and videos and they really push those boundaries of CGI, which stands for computer generated imagery for design purposes. Um, and my personal favorite designers working in this digital realm are Wang and Soderstrom. Um, they're a Danish duo who focuses on combining digital and physical explorations of materials and fabrication. Um, and they tend to work most closely between the real and the virtual, creating digital and then physical models of their design. So this hybrid approach to design is really going to be more and more prevalent in the future. And you, know, you guys being in the textile realm, I think you can see there's two images here that are showing textile, but again, completely made of pixel. So this is sort of, a, again, a whole new avenue of design that we're really gonna have to wrestle with. Like, is a rendered fabric still a fabric? Um, I think these are questions that you know, our generation and your generation gets to explore. Um, I think uh, one thing to think about is that like, as more humans are living, working and consuming via the internet, especially, since the start of, of COVID-19, our virtual worlds are quickly becoming embedded into our everyday lives. And you, know, you just have to look at how we use Zoom, especially you Zoom backgrounds and Snapchat and stories where we can really create these personalized experiences and visuals to share with the world. So as we move toward, towards um, incorporating these digital solutions into our everyday lives, these rendered realities are going to become more prevalent. There are many social issues today that benefit from the power of design. We as designers are challenged to analyze the implications of our work from the vantage point of servant humanity. And I really believe this, you know, when you're a designer out working in the world, you might feel the pressure of deadlines every day and, and the grind of just what you're working on all the time. Um, I think it's important to stop and, and ask yourself some of these questions. You know, is our work ethical? Are we sustainable? Are we giving back to our community? Um, is what we're doing having any social impact? These are really important questions that helps move our society forward. And design can do that. I think a lot of us designers forget that when we're in the day-to-day -day grind of what we're doing. So I do think it's important to take a step back and think about the social relevance of the work that you're doing and who are you serving? Um, when the pandemic started, we saw a lot of designers, makers, manufacturers step up, right? And, create design solutions. So starting with PPE for healthcare workers, um, there's a wonderful Instagram I recommend called Design Emergency. And it's Paula Antonelli, who is the design curator at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, along with Alice Roththorn, who's a British design writer. And they have this awesome Instagram that talks about how design can be used for social impact and creating solutions for things like COVID. Um, so check that out for sure. Um, so I was mentioning prior to the crisis, you know, we had a lot of good examples of design for the greater good, right? And so um, we started to see programs for global makers that, you know, people can make things and sell them that then supports their own community. Or designers here in the US were doing pro bono design to create housing or hospitals or schools in um, impoverished areas or underserved populations. So there is a lot of need um, in the world. Um, a lot of people meet, just have their basic needs not being met. And we even saw, you know, just last week with what happened in Texas with, you know, um, the problem of the infrastructure not working. That's actually, you know, a design and engineering problem and design can help solve some of these issues um, as well as issues of social equity and social justice. So as we move towards uh, a more inclusive and empathic society, we have to recognize that inclusion and empathy is an important criteria in design thinking. So I think it's, it should be the first and foremost principle in human-centered design, right? Like to be truly human, we have to have empathy for each other and to um, rebalance our planet and also continue to survive in the face of these many conflicts that we've been having lately. Um, and conflicts are not gonna go away. As you can see through hist history, you know, they, they come and go and design has to work to sort of balance these out. Um, design also has to serve all people in all populations, uh, including the aging, including those with neurodiverse or physical issues, and of course, those in need. 
Um, one designer who's working in this realm of social impact is Eve Behar. He has a firm in San Francisco called Fuse Project. So shown at the center is a great project that his firm did. Um, it's the first 3D printed community in the world. Um, he partnered with uh, an organization called New Story Charity. They're a nonprofit working to end global homelessness. And then he also partnered with a construction company called Icon and they are revolutionizing home building through digital uh, technology like 3D printing. And so these homes uh, designed by Behar literally were constructed in 24 hours for families in Latin America to access safe and affordable housing. So imagine again, if we have you know, another Hurricane Katrina, like we could 3D print houses for people who have lost their homes, for example. So this is just one great example of how design can serve humanity in a crisis. Um, you might also know about uh, Fuse Projects. Um, they had a really uh, well-known project that they did called One Laptop Per Child. And it was an in initiative where they designed a very uh, inexpensive laptop that came in a really cute green case so you could carry it around like a little briefcase. Um, and uh, it was crowdsourced or crowdfunded, I should say, and then distributed to children who don't have access to such things. So again, Fuse Project, a uh, great firm to keep an eye out for designing for social good. Um, also designing for the aging population is Lanzia Vecchia and Way. They've designed furniture and accessories for the elderly or those with limited mobility. And they see this as an underserved area of design. Um, and this is very true. Anyone who's even been to the hospital, even to the emergency room to get stitches, you look around and you're like, oh my gosh, like these places can look so much better. Like the textiles in healthcare could look better. Um, you know, there's so many areas of improvement. Um, and, you know, just look at all the, you know, wheelchairs and, and um, walkers and things like that. These can all be redesigned, not just for aesthetics, but for functionality and to let people have a better emotional connection to that functionality. So Lanzia Vecchia and Way created these um, walkers and things so that um, you know, people feel like they have an element of design and comfort and, and um, that balance of like ergonomics and it doesn't look like a, a clunky, ugly device, for example. Um, another uh, project that I think is really amazing on the upper right is this Warka water tower. Um, this is a great example of design for social impact. This is a water tower that collects water vapor from the um, atmosphere and it basically um, gets captured and drips down like it uh, condenses and you know drips down and collects into water droplets. And so these are put throughout places in Africa where um, they don't have access to uh, clean drinking water. I'm sure you guys know a lot of people actually have to walk miles a day to get clean uh, water for not just drinking, cooking, sanitation. So this is one of the bigger challenges we have today in the world and lots of designers. I just did a huge research project on, on water uh, and design. And um, this is just one example of many of lots of designers, you know, using some inventive and ingenious ways to figure out how to get water to these very remote uh, places in the world. Um, those of you who have seen me lecture before, I always include sneakers in my <laughs> talk. Um, and I think that's because they're small microcosms of society and really reflect back that in the design of the sneaker. So I'm showing a sneaker here at the bottom. Um, and this was a collaboration done uh, by someone called the Shoe Surgeon and then Thomson Reuters, who's a, um, a big company. And the sneaker was created to educate consumers about forced labor of workers in the fashion industry. So every detail of the sneaker and packaging was designed to actually let consumers know statistics about the issue. So for example, um, like on the back of the heel there, it says 25% of slaves in the fashion trade are children. Um, for the launch of this project, they created an unboxing video uh, for YouTube, which showed an influencer actually opening the sneaker box uh, and reading all the facts that were embedded into the design. The project actually makes you question what is the real price of sneakers? And this goes back to what I was saying earlier as a designer, like, you know, you might have clients, you get hired to do things, but let's think about the social impact of what we are designing um, and, and how is this made? Um, so I think that we can all take lessons from the sneakers or really any of these examples and apply them to design. If our industry and other design disciplines include um, environmental challenges and community while addressing humanitarian issues, the, I think the world would definitely uh, be a better place. So this next category is about being local. 
Um, one major focus of designing for social impact is actually community. This is um, defining kind of where you live, that's your community, and the people in your community are your tribe. Whether you know them or not, you are all collectively part of a community. However, before the pandemic, we were all global nomads. We felt at home in every corner of the globe. We were able to go anywhere, experience the world in person, and of course, participate in the global economy. And that even includes things like Amazon, you know, and easy international travel. Of course, that's all changed, but technology made all of that possible, right? And digital devices enabled our roaming behavior because we could always stay connected with our various tribes. So not just your community, but like your family, your work or your school. And in reaction to this globalization, however, we're starting to see this reversal, one that is more supportive of localism. And certainly during COVID, we've seen this become a huge trend. So localists are community-minded individuals who support local living and local economies. But then you have beyond that local vists who align themselves with activism. That's where that V comes in. They align themselves with activism for social causes. So they support shops and brands that are unique to one's own community and they value diversity and inclusivity for everyone in their community. So local vists also advocate for smart towns and cities where technology is used for the benefit of all citizens. So a smart city is using technology to leverage, um, you know, kind of how we all live. So, you know, having like a high speed transit system, which, you know, if you can shave a half hour of your commute off of work every day, you have an hour back to yourself for healthier living supposedly, right? Or free Wi-Fi for all, that would be amazing. Um, connectivity is an important feature of local living. So as humans, we crave belonging and we crave social inclusion in our community. So smart cities also allow access to green space for its inhabitants um, so that all can have access to nature and our local neighborhoods can be made to be more sustainable and equitable. Um, and I think that's something that we've learned from this pandemic. You know, I have a lot of friends who live in the country and so they're doing just fine during COVID because they can go out and take a walk and be distance and not see anybody. Um, that's not the case for me. I live in the heart of the Italian market and the minute I'm out, out, you know, I go out of my door, there's literally hundreds of people marching to Pats and Gino's and running me over and there's really no green space. So I have not been able to have that same kind of COVID experience and therefore I'm indoors more than someone who can live in the country. Um, and then, you know, and I'm, and I'm someone who, you know, I guess I could get in my car and drive and do that. And I have the privilege of doing that. There's also lots of people in different populations that don't have any access to green space. Um, and the same can be said about food, you know, like um, growing your own uh, garden. Um, here in the city, it, again, it's hard to do that. I can't have a garden, but there's community gardens and that's shared by all. And so that makes it more equitable. So that's uh, some, you know, examples of, of uh, localist thinking. Um, I wanna talk about some of the examples on the screen. I think that they're really um, interesting. The one on the right is from Print Your City. And this is um, where a town can decide on what they need for their community. And then they collect plastic waste that's destined for recycling from that specific neighborhood. So the plastics get melted down and 3D printed into new design objects for that chosen public space. So shown here at the right is a bench designed for a town in Greece. So I just love this because it allows the citizens in a community to, first of all, all contribute their recyclables. And also like we all don't know what happens when we put our recycling out. We trust that Philadelphia is doing something responsible, but do we really know? And during COVID, I can tell you, I've seen my trash and recycling get commingled many days when they come around for collection. So we don't really know what's, what's happening there. So this is a community-minded project that there's a goal, everyone collects their recyclables, the town decides what they need. In this case, they needed public benches and the plastic gets melted down, 3D printed, and then presented back to the community. And then the community gets to use it. Awesome example of local wisdom, right? Um, the grow room that you see by Ikea is also an interesting project. Um, and this is something I think often needed in urban communities, which is more outdoor gardens and more green space. And as I mentioned earlier, when you live in an urban area, there's not a lot of green space. Um, and something like this would be amazing where you can do it as a pop-up. So this was designed by Space 10. They're a research and design lab launched by IKEA. And this grow room is a spherical plywood pod that allows you to grow your own plants and food locally. And again, you can do this in any urban environment. The pod is open inside so people can actually walk in and immerse themselves in nature. So you get this like really nice um, sort of connection to what you're growing physically. 
Um, and the Grow Room is also available as open source design. So that means it's free and available for anyone to download the plans and you just gather the plywood and the parts yourself and you can make it. So that's a really cool example as well. So here we are in this new cultural moment and we're having these big cultural shifts that are making us question everything, right? Like during the pandemic, we're seeing nature replenish itself. Wildlife is actually repopulating. Carbon emissions have been reducing because we're not having as much travel. Um, we're also having an opportunity to rethink how we reopen society and reimagine how cities are going to operate. Um, and, and we're seeing this everywhere. You're seeing it at school. You're seeing, you know, with in, in corporate America, everyone's trying to figure out how to, how to reopen the office and reopen public spaces. Um, so we're not just going to return to normal because normal wasn't that great before. We need to remake things better. And I'm talking about from a sustainability standpoint. So here now we can think about adding more bike lanes, extending sidewalks to be more walkable, um, adding car free zones. And you know we're starting to see like restaurants are spilling out onto the streets, which makes um, it, cities more walkable and better therefore for people's health and well being, and of course for growing local business. So design is going to be a part of all of this, like rebuilding that local community where we can together reset the function of the street. We can be better neighbors and local vests and we can advocate for one another. And so my last um, section here is called survival. And I think it's the most appropriate uh, for what we've all gone through physically and emotionally over this last year. We're living in extreme and trying times, right? We have global warming, terrorism, nationalistic politics. This pandemic, of course, is threatening our sense of safety and security on our planet. And we're finding ways to survive and adapt to today's harsh realities. This is something that mankind has been doing since we've existed for millions of years. And in many cases, we need to be self-reliant today because people can no longer rely on our local or national governments to protect us. Um, I, I hate to say it, but every time I watch the news, I am reminded of that statement. Like we, we have to rely on ourselves and learn how to be self-reliant. Um, you know, we're seeing that even with vaccines that the government hasn't done a good job up until now of, of administering the program for vaccines. So it's completely random and not only in every state, but in every, um, you know, township. So as we're seeing um, the trend relate to this, we're seeing now protective clothing, protective gear, protective furniture, all of these things that shield us from the elements, but also coronavirus. Masks and protective clothing have become essential for survival. And also this idea of utility, like how useful is something going to be to you in your lifestyle? So this idea of utility is gonna become the design language of the future. Um, and I think looking at those Craig Green jumpsuits uh, from Montclair, um, or Montclair is probably how the French say it. Um, you know, obviously these are not very, uh, I don't know, I don't even have a word for it. Like, are these really practical to wear down the street or going to Target or going grocery shopping? Probably not. However, if you're in a flood um, or, you know, we need to socially distance, these outfits are quite practical in that sense. I mean, yes, they look silly, but this is high fashion today. Um, so we're thinking about things like barriers, like shields and devices and materials, all that are going to integrate into our lives that help us survive and also give us a sense of protection. And that's really what this is about. Um, we're seeing furniture solutions um, in interior design. So things, you know, even before COVID, we had a lot of products that were all about privacy in the, these open plan areas in the workspace, such as um, this hooded screen that you see on the right. But now we're gonna see these types of furniture actually adapt and have dual use where they're not only gonna be physical enclosures to physically separate us from others, but also, um, you know, have that social distance space so that uh, germs like COVID are not, or coronavirus are not spreading. Um, we need to also look at cleanability. This is going to be very important, certainly for the textile industry. This is a huge challenge. You know, how do we, um, you know, people, are, people have the uh, idea that they should use chemicals to clean germs. I'm not 100% on board with that, but, um, you know, like if you put bleach on textiles, that's the end of your textile. So we have to figure out ways of of, of cleaning that are not abrasive and, and also you know, harmful to human health, let alone uh, materials. Um, and, and this is also sort of a burgeoning field that will be part of this survival trend. Um, one interesting project I wanna point out, and we, got, we actually had this installed in Philadelphia at the, the Philadelphia Art Museum last year. Um, so London Architecture um, 
this picture of these two weird looking pods. This was designed in 2018 in Finland. And these are inflatable pods. They're filled with air and water, which is of course what we as humans need to survive. And these pods react to changes in the environment through sensors. So for example, when you enter the pod, carbon dioxide from our own exhaled breath is detected by the pod and then causes the pod to move with you as if it's also exhaling. So you're having this like symbiotic relationship to it. And then glowing light that turns on um, changes color with temperature changes. So again, like with the more bodies in there and the more carbon dioxide being breathed, the temperature goes up and then it again reacts to that as well. So the pods don't have a functional purpose as more like as protection, but they illustrate that there is that symbiotic relationship between humans and our environment and it's actually quite delicate. And I think as humans, we forget that. We forget that we are made of nature, we belong to nature, we return to nature when we die. Like we are nature and your iPhone does not come with you. Um, and so I think this exhibit does a really good job of reminding us of that. Um, and I think we need these kinds of examples to show us that while we do need to survive these certain factors in nature today, like climate change and COVID and whatnot, um, nature is also affected by us. Like there is that balance and, and you know, climate change has been caused by human activity. There's actually a, a, a term that scientists have given to that. Um, it's called the Anthropocene. That's the new geological era that we live in, which is anthro meaning man has damaged the earth. And there's evidence of that. Um, so I'm gonna leave you just with that last example to think about, it's a good place to ponder like what's next? How can we collectively design, not just for our own survival, but for nature itself? We have to advocate for nature, for it to survive and therefore for us to survive. And so how will you sustain? So thanks everybody. We can open it up to questions now. Joyce, thank you. That was fantastic. Thought provoking presentation and inspiring at the same time. Uh, so one of the questions that has come in is, could you share your thoughts on boomers in the market? How do boomer, boomers or business of the boomer generation keep up to speed with a modern market? Wow, that is a great question. Um, it's funny, just yesterday I was doing some trend research for something I'm writing and um, I noticed that five generations were called out and boomers were the last generation. And I thought, well, that's weird because 10 years ago, we used to talk about another generation beyond boomers that we called traditionalists. And these were people that really like served in, in World War I and II. And, you know, they're sadly, um, you know, passing away now. They're all in their 90s and older. Um, and I noticed that that generation was actually sort of removed from this list. And so boomers have now taken that, that spot up of being the oldest generation. So there is that shift in a way. Um, and I, I find that really interesting. And my parents are baby boomers, they're in their mid seventies. Um, and I think we're seeing a few things. Number one is that boomers are living much longer than that traditionalist period that I just mentioned, um, because we have you know, science and technology and um, just lots of advances and, and progression and things, you know, people can live longer. And so um, the boomer generation is still you know, they're still spending money, they're still traveling, they're still vital, they're still consumers, right? They're not um, kind of wasting away somewhere, they're very active. And so, you know, all of us as designers have to think about that market. And so this is a great question because, you know, we can't only design for Gen Z, which is, you know, 20 and younger, um, we have to really be thinking about all populations. And that's why I talked about aging because that boomer generation, you know, while they're living longer, um, and this is even in my generation, I'm a Gen X or in my fifties, like, you know, we're all starting to get health issues and like, you know, we're going to live a long time with these health, health issues because we can, we can take medication every day and whatnot, but we are going to have issues like mobility issues or hearing issues or whatnot. So the, the more we can tune in with these different generations, especially boomers, because there's a lot of them, they're a very big generation. Um, Gen X is a small generation sandwiched between two very large generations, you know, millennials and, and um, boomers, and, and boomers are going to stick around. So I think designing for their specific needs is really important. So much attention has been paid on millennials over the last decade, and, and rightfully so. They're a very large generation with unique um, sort of attributes because they grew up, you know, as digital natives. 
Um, but boomers did not, just like my generation did not grow up as digital natives. And so you have to really think about the generations um, in terms of what they're in context, like what, what are they used to? And we, right before this call, we were even talking about boomers, you know, learning how to use their iPhones, you know, and like my mom is sending me Bitmoji, like who knew that she could do that, right? So I, I think, you know, it's just a good question in the fact that, you know, we can raise consciousness and awareness of, you know, we can't just design a one size fits all approach to anything anymore, which is hard because we also talk about diversity. We wanna design for as many people as possible and include as many different types of people, whether that's generational, whether that's ability or disability, um, ace, rage, gender, you name it, like all of that is in included in that. But then, you know, each generation um, also has needs that need to be met. So it's a very big um, chunk to think about when you're designing, um, but we need to think about it. I hope I answered the question. I thought that was a, a great a great response. I have one quick follow up to that, and then we've got, of course, a, a list of questions that are coming into the chat to us. Um, so, so as you think about designing for all of these different populations, is it, from your perspective, is it better to design a product that is more inclusive and works across generations and for a wider population, or is it about creating for individual populations in different ways? I think it really depends on what you're being asked to do and like who your client is. Um, obviously, you have to deliver what your client is paying you to do as a designer. But I think that you can bring up these questions to your client. And that's why I mentioned, you know, having an awareness of designing for social impact, because, you know, a lot of clients think of only about their own needs and rightfully so, like they're paying money to design a building or des design a product for whatever it is they want to get out there. Um, and it's our job as designers to sort of help push the boundary a little bit and get them thinking about bigger issues. Um, and, you know, I've been in this industry almost 30 years. Next year is going to be 30 years for me. And I wish I had learned this lesson a lot sooner because I felt for a long time that designers couldn't really contribute to the betterment of our world. But I see that I was wrong because we have the voice and the capability to put things out in the world that really do change people's lives. Um, and, and make change in, in all different kinds of ways, but especially in cultural ways. You know, think about the person who designed the first iPhone, like that changed the world, right? Think about the person who's designing, you know, like the syringes for COVID vaccine, you know, they, you know, I don't know if they're standard this year or not. I just threw that out there as an example, but you know, there's lots of ways that people contribute um, and you can hit your client's goals, but then, you know, can we get them to think beyond that? That's the question. And I think all of us have it in us to do that, to ask our clients, you know, well, can we design for, for other generations or other uses or, you know, how inclusive can we get? I think that's a, a, a good thing to do as a practice. Thank you. Um, our next question is from Megan. Megan will pose it. Grace. So I would love to get your opinion on this. There's been a lot of comparisons uh, from this pandemic to the last pandemic roughly 100 years ago. And the trends after that pandemic tended towards the luxurious and the frivolous and quite a lot of um, celebration of life. And, and that came through in design as well as behavior. But in, I'm talking about design. So do you see any of that aspect in your future visions of the trends? Do you? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And I'm sure you're referring to the roaring 20s. Um, <laughs> um, I think behaviorally, yes, we'll probably see lots of babies being born and lots of people partying, but I think it's temporary. Um, I think we're gonna take some long-term lessons from this last year. Um, and that's good. I, you know, I don't always look at these experiences as necessarily a bad thing. Like we've learned some really great lessons during COVID about what we need to change moving forward. And I was talking about, you know, like our dealing with climate change and, and, you know, I do think like social behaviors are going to change. Like I was talking about earlier when I got on, the handshake might go away. We might not ever shake hands again. And we might have to figure out some other way of communicating, whether it's the elbow bump or a, fit or a foot shake or, you know, some other way of saying hi to someone. Um, you know, those, th those kinds of behaviors will absolutely shape design because design is always a reflection of what's happening 
in culture. Um, but I think this has been a really good lesson about um, some dire problems that we have and how we have to fix them. And I don't know, you know, it's hard to know. Obviously, we weren't around in 1918 when the pan that pandemic hit um, to know, you know, what lessons did they take from that. Um, but I think we have the added problem of climate change um, that they did not have because that's really, you know, urgent. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, in our industry, when I say our industry, I mean sort of the, the greater design industry and, and certainly in construction and building design, um, you know, carbon dioxide emissions, and this is true for manufacturers and all textile mills, everybody has to reduce their carbon emissions. That's like priority number one right now. Um, and so I think that, you know, those kinds of environmental issues are also gonna get added to your, you know, the, the sort of behavioral things that you mentioned. Um, and I think that's why, you know, the partying will be temporary because we have a lot of work to do. Um, I don't think we can party our way, you know, out of this. <laughs> you know, and if we don't do the work, like the, our planet may not be saved. And I hate to say that, but we're seeing it over and over and over again. You know, terrible, terrible examples of how climate is wreaking havoc. Well, and I've got a, I've got a great follow on. You've touched on this a bit, both in your talk and, and in the response to the question that Megan just posed from Noah, one of our great seniors, that he wants to ask in reference to returning to normal, and that's in quotations, and how we rethink what the norm is and how we have to reevaluate how we live and our local communities. From what you have seen and heard, do you think that that this is a possibility? I think the question is the returning to normal. Or is it even being talked about and considered enough? Yeah, that is an awesome question. And um, I, I, what I'm hearing and, and, and the research I've been doing is that we don't want to return to normal because normal wasn't so great. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, yes, it was great to be in public and be all together. And, and that's not what I mean by that. What I mean is that, you know, normal led to the problems that we have now of climate change and um, the social injustices that we see. And so now is the perfect time to get educated so that we can try to fix these things. And everybody has a, a role and a place to play in that. Um, and I think, you know, you guys as, as students are in a really lucky position that you are learning about these issues like sustainability and equity. You know, my generation didn't learn about those things in school at all. And I really wish we had because it would have made me a better designer, you know, 15, 20 years ago. Um, so I think taking advantage of, you know, learning what you can from this year of COVID um, and figuring out what things do we want to keep and what things don't we want to keep? You know, I know like, you know, I work a lot with interior designers and, and architects and we talk a lot about what is the office going to look like coming back? And believe me, there's a lot of things people don't want to keep anymore. Um, and there are things that we, we want to make better. So it's going to, culturally, it's going to be hard. Everybody's going to have to weigh in from these different business sectors on, you know, what is really relevant. And I think we're going to see some new changes. You know, like I don't think everyone's going to return 100% back to the office. Um, I think people are gonna work from home a couple of days a week and that's gonna be the new norm. You know, and I hate using that phrase, the new norm because it changes all the time. But, um, you know, that's one lesson that we've learned and that companies are also gonna have to allow people more flexibility. You know, um, it used to be like, if you were not at your desk at the office, people thought you were like, not a good worker. I mean, imagine that. And meanwhile, you're like in the bathroom or just getting a cup of coffee and you were so worried that if you weren't seen at your desk, you're not seen as being productive. COVID has 100% changed that. And that old thinking is like out the window now. And it's really about, you know, people want to be productive um, on their own time and having that flexibility. So that's a good thing we've learned from COVID. And I think we're going to keep that and move that forward into whatever is next. And that's just one of like literally thousands of examples of how culture will change. From, from what you have seen and heard, are there specific changes that you see coming to both office or contract environments as well as to residential home environments as a result of, of this past year with the pandemic? That's also another good question. And I, I think it's hard to answer because we're not quite there yet. Like um, a lot of design firms like, you know, Gensler and HOK and Perkins and Willies are like the, the biggest and best design firms in the world, you know, have all been doing these kinds of research projects with their customers, trying to understand like, what is that future workplace going to look like? And I'm not sure anyone has an answer just yet. 
Like, I think we're in the throes of trying to figure that all out. Um, but I, you know, I, I'm very optimistic in that, um, you know, designers are people that are very capable of imagining the future and then using their talent and skills to deliver the future. So I do think all of us as designers will play a role in that. I, I just, I think it's too soon to actually say, what is that solution going to look like? I, I, I probably can safely say we won't do benching. Benching is like when you have a long desk with like 20 people all sitting next to each other, like you would see like on Wall Street or, you know, I, I don't think you're going to literally have somebody sitting right next to you in the future. I think that we can safely say. Um, you know, a lot of people are arguing like, do we take more real estate and spread people out? Or do we let people work from home and just come to the office for like community things and collaboration things? So I think that's what's being worked on right now. No one has the answer quite yet. And it, it does, it feels like a pendulum that swings one direction and then is swinging the other way. Um, I, yeah. I wonder I wonder if part of it is as perhaps simple, which is not necessarily simple, as building spaces that have some amount of flexibility to them so that they can be used in, in different ways, can safely be used in different ways, yes, safely absolutely. and and productively. Yeah. And I think it will be different for different companies. Like a lot of companies are discussing, you know, how do they define their culture and express that through the built environment? Like that's really what interior design is all about. Um, and that's hard to do if a lot of your staff is remote. So in the future, it's like, how can we still have our corporate culture be represented through this physical space um, if we're only doing 50% of the activities we used to do in that built space. So that's really going to be the question. Um, so now we're learning digital cultures, right? Like Zoom and how to, how to have events, you know, um, together uh, remotely. And, but that's going to also have to partner with this physical piece, which is, like I said, still up in the air. But yes, flexibility will absolutely be the key. And have in your experience do you have any any tips for how how does one replicate if it's even possible the sense of community that exists when we used to be able to be together in maker spaces or in workspaces and now we're via zoom or teams or some other remote application what are what are some strategies for creating, building, or extending that sense of community that exists in person now in a digital environment? Yeah. Um, I know a lot of people are wrestling with that. I personally find Zoom and all these, these sort of webinar type things actually really interesting and exciting. And I find that they can be more intimate than if you were in an auditorium listening to someone. And I'll give you an example. Like I had a board meeting this morning. I'm on the steering committee for Design Philadelphia and we had a, a, our kickoff meeting and it's a big committee. So back in the day when I used to go to the Center for Architecture and have these meetings, there'd be a lot of us in a big multi-purpose room and I'm only saying hi and talking to maybe three or four people. And I can't see all the people sitting behind me that are commenting and whatever. But now we're all on Zoom and I could actually see everyone. And I'm like, oh, I didn't know you were on our committee. Like, you know, so now I'm like actually interacting face to face and having a, a little bit, it's a little bit more intimate, which sounds crazy to say that, that you could be more intimate um, online, but it's because you have more visibility. And another trend I'm hearing about too, and I think this is very true, is that um, there's more equity on Zoom. Like the CEO, is on with all their workers or the teacher is on with all their students and there's a little bit more equity like everybody is the same size square and so everybody can have a voice and which is different when you're in a boardroom sitting at a conference table and somebody's at the head of the table and they're leading the conversation that's a little bit different than you know having this sort of equity on the screen um, and people who normally might not feel like they can speak up in a room are feeling that they can on zoom so that's a very interesting cultural phenomenon that I, I think we will take as a good thing that we want to bring forward. I, I love that idea of equity and the fact that equity keeps coming into the conversation yes. in, in different ways. Um, I wonder how different this presentation would have been a year and a half ago. So not just in terms of the physical space, the fact that we're all now looking at each other via Zoom, but in terms of you selecting five trends, how different do you feel this would have been a year and a half ago, um, aka pre-COVID? 
I think I would have had all the same categories, actually. Um, it just wouldn't have had the lens of obviously COVID and maybe survival would have a, a different meaning. Um, because a lot of these topics are things I've actually been talking about for, for quite a long time. Um, you have a few people on the call I see that have been to some of my other trend lectures and I talk a lot about, uh, you know, sustainability and biomaterials and, um, you know, even a couple of years ago, I was talking about superbugs, like, you know, in doing my trend research, I had heard that there, you know, we have the potential for these superbugs coming. No one ever imagined it would be like COVID that we would be, you know, sequestered at home for a year. Um, but, um, you know, survive, survival is not a current, it's not a trend. I mean, you know, people, humans have had to survive since, you know, humans came to the earth, right? Like, I don't mean came to the earth like <laughs> I just realized it made it sound like we're aliens. Um, you know what I mean? Like, you know, mankind has always had to survive and there, you know, there's always been different, um, you know, sort of things that we have to think about. And just like a hundred years ago, you had brought up Megan, you know, um, the pandemic from 1918. And, and again, like there was a great war then, you know, war, there's always war, there's always disease, there's always bad behavior, there's always politics, like there's always all of that. So, you know, right now, for me, this, a lot of these ideas came from things that I've already been thinking about and writing about and talking about, but they are so much more in the spotlight now because of COVID. And that's the thing about cultural shifts, you know, they really are related. And, and many, truly many of your, many of your five topics all have a wellness component as part of it. You know, my, my first thought was wellness fits into survival, but no, in reality, wellness fits into, I think, pretty much all of your all of your categories one way or another. How, how are you at Mohawk addressing wellness? Um, we have a really amazing um, sustainability platform that's completely woven in, I'm gonna use a textile pun there, woven into everything that we do. Um, so at Mohawk, we really try to align design, sustainability, and then innovation. So innovation meaning like the looms we're using, the different kinds of technology, like we do print also. Um, and really, and even yarn, like we invent our own yarn. So making sure that everything that we design and create is meeting, you know, innovative standards, sustainability standards that we have set for ourselves. Um, and it's actually quite rigorous. Um, you know, our, we're very transparent. We divulge everything that we do. Um, our factory where we make uh, our carpet is also very rigorous. And, you know, um, we literally, like I said, report out everything like material transparency. What are the materials we're using? Where, where do we get our raw ingredients from? Um, but then design itself is also tied to sustainability. Like you, somebody mentioned biophilia earlier, um, you know, uh, really thinking about, um, is this product going to make an important sort of connection to people with health and wellness and sustainability? And so many designers are designing spaces that have to be spaces of health and wellness. Um, and the reason we talk so much about that is because for many, many decades, buildings have not been those places. They've been places where people got, you know, lead poisoning or molds, you know, breathing in mold or sick building syndrome or, you know, and on top of that, the construction industry is one of the most wasteful. Like if you go to a landfill, what's in the landfill? Our household trash and, you know, stuff from buildings that was demoed. Um, and it's the same again with carbon emissions, the construction industry, especially concrete, the making of concrete really contributes very highly to CO2 emissions. So again, it's all related. And if we're going to be a manufacturer that is contributing, we don't want to add to the problems, we want to alleviate the problems. So we actually call that hand printing instead of footprinting. Like footprint is like when you make a carbon footprint, like how much, you know, energy are you consuming today? Or how much, you know, like every time you throw out something and put it in the trash, like what is the carbon footprint of that product? Um, we wanna reverse that. And instead we are contributing, uh, it's called being net positive. So, you know, net positive water, net positive energy, net positive carbon. Meaning if our plant is, you know, we're running all our looms all day and that takes a lot of energy, we wanna put energy back on the grid. We don't wanna just take, we're gonna give back. We do the same with water. Um, we actually don't use water for dyeing because we do what's called solution dyeing, which I'm sure you guys are familiar with. Um, so we actually use water to cool down the looms. They get so hot because they run really fast all day, every day. 
Um, but the water gets cleaned and gets put back out into the river cleaner than when it came in. So that would be an example of hand printing, for example. Um, and also teaching is, is hand printing, like teaching the next generation how to be sustainable and how to design for health and wellness. Um, I could talk for hours about this issue. It's, it's so important. I myself am a cancer survivor. So I think by nature, I, I got into thinking about, um, you know, the materials I'm exposed to. And I'm really proud to work for a company that cares about material health and that we don't want to pollute and we certainly don't want to poison anyone. So um, it's, it's important. And I think again, as designers, like these are things you can think about, you know, sustainability is not just about one thing. It's, it's a multifaceted, multi-pronged approach. You know, it's how things are made, where things are made, the raw materials, the, you know, even getting into equity, like, you know, where are you getting your raw materials from? And like I mentioned with the sneakers, are children making these sneakers? Like that would be awful, right? So just getting into that level of detail um, is really important. Hey, thank you for that. And I, we have one comment here that I'm gonna share and we'll make this the last comment. Uh, um, I hope this teaches us to be more thoughtfully and empathetically proactive moving forward shifting from being reactive to being proactive. And I, I think that's a, a wonderful way to, to sum this up. So Royce, thank you so much for that wonderful, inspiring, thought-provoking presentation. Um, You're welcome. Thanks you everyone did. for joining us. It was nice yeah. to see, see all of you and see some of my old friends on here with me too. Again, our thanks to everyone. Everyone stay well and we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you so much. Thank you.